Hi there, Randy Green here. Let us continue. We are on page 49. I'm going to talk about the reptile settlements on Maldag and some of the avian settlements on Mars. Again, we are in the Sirius system that at the time was a hub. It was not a stellar constellation as we know of it today. That was the effect of the timeline event that divided it into Sirian A and Sirian B. At the time, it was what we call a stellar system in the middle domains of the LPU or the Universal Matrix. And this is how I recall it. And as I said in all of my other levels of this work, it could be as it was, or it could be interception. But this is how I recall it, and this is how I've written it in The Souls of Humanity. If you ask of me if I see it completely that way today, I would say perhaps, perhaps not. But that's because I have got other levels of information that now begins to question my own memories. But at the time when I wrote it, that was how I saw it altogether. Uh, due to more information I've got now, then we could say either I've been intercepted and I'm beginning to doubt my own information and by that in, in many ways and forms uh, make it less um, valid. Or we could say I've got more nuances to it so I can perhaps add in other levels of information. That's the whole purpose of me reviving and looking back into this material because there are things that, that I would say that is how I saw it at the time. Now I might see it differently. In the future, I might actually go back to see it that way again, but altogether, um, this is how I see it. And when I did the template readings that followed later on, I got confirmation of these different groups. Okay, so when we talk about Maldag, uh, we all know that's the asteroid belt today. And after the timeline event, uh, Maldag exploded in the timeline event. So for me, the timeline event, uh, even though you say, well, Maldag exploded much later, uh, we could say the original Syrian workstations were divided during the timeline event and the original Maldakian workstation were transformed into what was left of what we understand as Maldag as a planet. At the time, it was a reality field. So that was something entirely else. We didn't have planets. We had domains. We had reality fields. They were not in any ways or forms, uh, stellar systems or galaxies or what have you that we see in the sky and we experience today because that didn't exist at the time. But there were different types of dimensions, different types of levels of sub-realities, and they were all uh, merged together in this holographic network that unfolded as different reality fields. And as you recall from the previous podcast, it divided into two groups, the LPF2 or the Universal Matrix and the Holographic Metaverse that was the original true human um, um, metaverse where we all originated from as the universal cycles. The ones that are part of the LPU, they're pro the humanoids will probably say the opposite because as time has passed by, most of the original holographic metaverse uh, true human races have moved on and whatever was left of uh, reality fields there has now gone dormant. And what is left is the universal matrix. And by that, the universal matrix is suddenly the only active sector that's left in the cycles that we are now part of. And by that, suddenly what was part of the universal matrix on top level from the Lyran system became the origin of whatever's here, which it was, but is sprung from another um, holographic uh, universal matrix, not matrix, but uh, metaverse, that were configured and operated in completely dissimilar ways, which I explained in the previous podcasts. So in that way, you can say as the other groups around us have moved on, then, then we are the last group that's stuck here. And then suddenly we become the sole groups and the sole, the only ones that are in this universal structure. And by that, we have that idea that because of that, then we are perhaps the only ones that have existed since uh, memories and original understanding of how it used to be has been lost due to the different types of engineering as well as the timeline event that completely, uh, to a large degree, eradicated a lot of the original understandings and knowledge of how it was and how it used to be. So when we talk about the Maldakian races, they were kind of a reptoid settlement. And here reptoid, I refer to a type of genetics that later on spawned their understandings of reptilians. Reptilians are, uh, they have reptoid genetics, but the reptoid genetics go back to prior the timeline event into specific humanoid groups that lived in their 
uh, what we call density two civilizations in the reality fields that uh, later on turned into what we understand as the Draco races. But the reptoid genetics, they were a part of the different types of genetics that were artificially engineered as part of the humanoid civilization of the parallel universal matrix, as it's originally were called the LPU. And we are, those of us who exist here today, the enclosure and what we are in this solar system is now part of the LPU, even though it wasn't to begin with. And that's the whole idea of the resetting that our solar system is resetting to the original configuration of the ancient ones. Why, why do I bring in the whole Maldark? Well, there are many different uh, opinions about Maldark and they had a huge cataclysmic event um, in the later planetary system that then turned into the asteroid belt. That was after the timeline event, once the reality field had solidified, accreted around the core and became a planet. The groups that were before that, and this is important because now I'm going to talk about the Maldakians in their original form before the timeline event. And they, they are best described as the gods from Valhalla, not the Nordics. These are the Pleiadian races that were captured by uh, during the reptilian riots and were re-engineered to hold reptile genetics, which, which they didn't have to begin with. So that's a whole other group and they're in alignment with the reptilians. But the Maldakians, they are the ones that uh, when you watch the, the, um, the Stargate TV show, there are at some point, I can't remember when it was, there are this point where there's a specific group of Asgardians that are shown as a specific type of greys. They're dissimilar to other greys, they're not insectoid based. They are of this reptoid group that used to be Maldakians. And they used to be what we could call like the Nordic gods. Not the Nordic, these are the Pleiadian with reptoid genetics from another uh, level of our history. But the Maldakians, the ones that survived, traveled to the moon, which is the remnant of what's left of Maldak after the explosion. That part of Maldak that were transferred into our uh, orbit around our planet is what's left of Maldak as it accreted again and became what we call a planetoid from where the Maldakians then continued their existence as now what we would call a type of lunar race. I also say at other places that the moon, as we know of it, uh, is kind of a planetoid that's come from, from lunar races that came from another scheme. That's the Maldakians. But I have just for the sake of easiness just called it that because the lunars also became merged with other groups that came from other systems that were similar to the type of technocratic societies that was on Maldak. So that way, again, we have this weird merging that makes it so difficult because our brains would like it to be one way. It's just the lunar that came from the lunar scheme. That's, that's what the esoterics call it. But when you look at the lunar scheme, then it was divided into different reality fields that had different civilizations. And all of these, as the lunar scheme fell, why did it fall? Well, it was part of some of the, the, the things that happened during the timeline event. And they teamed up and settled on the moon as they came here as refugees from what was left of their original reality field as it crum crumbled and fell uh, after the timeline event. And they settled on versions of the moon because the moon we have today is not the moon that was in the times after the timeline event. So it has been recreated many times. But the grit of the Baldakian reality field is what is in the moon. It has been later on engineered to hold other groups from other uh, uh, civilizations that were part of the lunar scheme. And when we talk about a scheme, then we talk about a, a quadrant or a sector that held specific groups within the LPF2 or LPF3 that hold specific type of consciousness potentials and by that produces specific type of quote unquote civilizations. So it's interesting that the uh, the Maldakians, they had this reptile mammal, mammal type of consciousness structure and they were originally benevolent in nature um, and they were, they are, the that group of greys that are called the Asgardians, they were originally the Maldakians. 
and they mostly held what we call tall blonde human looking features not the Nordics, but the, this is kind of many of the civilizations at the time, they had that feature because why choose to be ugly, right? <laughs> if you have all the possibilities in the world and you're kind of radiating, then you will naturally have specific features. And I know there are, who is it that talks about this? I think it's Stephen Greer that talks about these original races as kind of uh, ethnically, uh, favorizing the tall, blonde, blue-eyed type of structure that we saw specific groups in the human history that favored that type of feature. But the matter of the fact is that that's, there were also black-skinned races and there were brown-skinned races. Brown-skinned races with, with green eyes or black eyes or blue hair or green hair or um, white-skinned races with green hair. There were many different features. So, so this is just our solar system had a specific type of preference for a specific type of human looking very tall beings at the time because we had the fourth dimension. So the holographic units were not so dense that comprised it into this more physical matter form we have today. And when we talk about the Pleiadians, well, they also chose the blonde figures uh, type of Caucasian type of, of uh, configuration. But the, uh, the, the black skin, some of the black, very, very dark black skin, tall, um, I would almost, there are some African uh, groups in, uh, from, from the continent of Africa that still have the same type of very black skin that, that are the descendants of these groups that were also positioned in uh, adjacent reality fields that were connected to the Sirius system, as well as Mars. So I'm, I'm just putting in there, let's not get caught up with all, all of these tall blonde ones that are typically being used in the depictions of the quote unquote descended masters or the quote unquote Ashtar command or quote unquote galactic federation. And that's the later as in imposing a holographic overlay to some of the species that perhaps once looked like that. But if you go beyond the holographic overlay, you will get a completely um, different type of being that's behind that because they have deteriorated and they just like humans on this planet uh, doing Botox and, and cosmic uh, reparations and and um, different forms of longevity treatments. There are groups out there that are doing the exact same thing. They're just using holographic overlay, pretending to be something they are actually not. There are some pretty nasty insectoid races that have the ability to do the holographic overlay and present themselves to be almost angelic looking. When the matter of the fact is that when you go beyond that, you will see something that will um, probably be more part of a horror movie than actually what they're trying to present themselves to be. So the Asgardians, as we know of them now, that gray species, are the original Maldakians. They have changed. They left the moon at some time. Then the moon got occupied by other groups that came in and took it over. These are mostly the ones I refer to as the lunar races because they came from different groups of the lunar um, what do you call it, scheme that is called something entirely else. And again, please don't ask me, what is it called then? Well, it's beyond our language. I can make a sound, a weird uh, series of sounds and, and draw some symbols, but that will not make sense. So let's just call it the lunar scheme as the Alice Bela material calls it. But these are different civilizations from parallel system that settled on the moon after the Asgardians took off and decided to travel around, uh, mostly on their very, very big uh, white crafts that are kind of flat and, and defies all dynamics of what we see as a type of, um, um, what do you call it, spacecraft that is capable of navigating in space-time. So with that, the uh, the Asgardians, why did they change from being <laughs> the Maldakians and on the moon? And why did they shift sides, so to speak, and aligned with uh, their what we call lesser benevolent forces? And that is because they also had a warring streak and groups of them decided to team up uh, with the reptilians in the reptilian riots. And the reptilian riots is what led to the occupation of our solar system. They shifted side. But before that, uh, before the timeline event and before the demolishing of their own planet that pushed them into shift side and take part of the occupation of our solar system, they lost their own planet, no place to live. They got the moon, not a good place. 
okay, we side up with the bad guys, so we perhaps could colonize some of the benevolent or what we call the benef, benef what do you call it, uh, fruitaceous, prosperous, uh, what was left of the planets in the solar system so they could get a new place to live, aka on the earth. So with that, uh, that uh, scientific level that they had, uh, how to work with plants, they try to refurbish, let's call it that, the moon with the scientific knowledge they had of how to work with plant life. But due to the circumstances of uh, what was left of the moon of the Maldakian grid, it was mainly the technological level that had survived, the level that held life forms as we know of it were no longer uh, possible to uphold and thereby also why they have shifted into the semi-organic version as we know as the Asgardians. On page 51, I talk about some of the avian settlements on what we now know as Mars. Contrary to the Maldakian settlement, the Martian settlements, and of course it was called something else, held LPF2 avian races. And again, remember LPF2 is similar to density 2, is similar to the consciousness level, it's not about the organic level. That's the fourth dimension. So in the fourth dimension of what we understand as Mars today, the lowest level of the LP of two middle domain races, we had the avian races and they were humanoids as well. And they had changed over the course of time, beginning to regress. They were originally also part of the Syrian system and hence the blue skin. Blue skin people, uh, blonde haired, blue eyed, skinned, a white skinned people are also part of the Syrian system. So this is a, a feature of the Sirius workstations. The Pleiadians at the time and what we call in the LP of two, they had some of these kind of features, but there were also, as I talked about, black skinned and brown skinned and white skinned and yellow skinned. So we can't just say that there's one specific type of group. Many of these different types of groups have either moved on or, or no longer exist. But on the settlements of Mars at the time, before the timeline event, and to some degree after the timeline event as well, we had the avians. And the LPF2 avians had got LPF3 TGs added to be able to exist inside the Syrian uh, areas or the LPF3 areas under the Syrian workstations. The 511 pillar connected to Vega. Most of them were ready to enter the LPF3 level of genetics and thus the TGs only amplified the existing possibilities in them. The LPF2 avians looked less human or more humanoid. Given that they had light to dark blue skin, avian facial features, and a smaller thin body resembling an upright bird, but without the feathers for most part. They kind of had the bird uh, feathers on their chest and their neck and their heads. Some did have tiny soft feathers with rainbow coloration in the feathers on their chest and uh, on their head. Naturally, the torso was not as big as we see it in birds on our planet because the aliens on Mars, what was now called Mars, did not have the capacity to fly and thus were in no need of the great bundle of muscles in the torso. I was just thinking about some of the depictions of the Sumerian quote-unquote gods that are fighting these avian bird-like beings that are a kind of a hybrid. And um, we're also thinking about when we talk about the falcon guardians of the Egyptian uh, settlements or the pharaohs uh, and the, in, the, in the temple depictions where you have uh, the, the human body but with falcon heads. And the, these are some of the Ra Confederation. The Ra Confederation were, were also part of Mars, but that's later on, that's after the timeline event. But the interesting thing is these blue avians. And uh, writing about that in 2014 as part of my material, as I saw them and were remembering them, whether it's true or not. And it's also important to notice here that they had LP3 TGs inserted into them. So when they decided to leave Mars, uh, whether it, I have a recall memory of uh, most of the settlements on Mars uh, due to the reptilian rise or the colonization of our solar system. They left, they took off. And what was left on Mars were some of the other types of humans, the dark skinned, uh, literally black skinned humans. Uh, and I recall 
um, going into some of the, the technological labs that they had there and going to a cave system where groups of people were gathered, trying to avoid the scavengers and the reptilians that were now completely raiding uh, the surface of Mars. So that's kind of how I remember uh, Mars getting transformed into a reptilian outpost. But before that, it was an avian outpost. The Martian avians were clever and scientific by nature due to the high ratio of LPR3 TDs. These TDs, technologically enhanced genetics, enable them to function in the series system, although on lower levels. The settlements on Mars unfolded all sorts of scientific laboratories and spacecraft landing stations and became the center of technological innovations, trade of TDs and sciences in the series system. As the series system grew in size and the settlements grew along with it, other races joined the collaboration of the, whole, the, the joint collaboration between the humans and the, true, the humanoids in the series system. So with that, we, we understand this. Why am I bringing this one up? First and foremost, it gives a background history of the moon. Secondly, it gives the background history of why Mars is coveted for the different uh, military projects that are now going on on Mars, or at least uh, were at some point in human history, probably still is. But what I have of memories from there is from 2014 and until 2017. And with that, we understand that the blue avians that were on Mars, they took off and then it was occupied and taken over by the reptilians and the scavengers that are hybrid race uh, that do have avian genetics. There are many different types of scavengers. These scavenger groups are under uh, Enki. And Enki himself is from the royal reptilians. And there are different groups of reptilians that goes from the Draco system. And by that annexing, the Martian system to be part of the 14 pillar as that fell onto the hands of the Draco reptilians. And that's the reptilian riots because they were playing nicely to begin with. But after the timeline event and they regressed and they completely, uh, uh, what we call disengaged from the rest of the collaborations between the humanoids and the true humans and decided that they no longer wanted to play nice as they grew more and more um, aggressive and violent and strong in their feature, the reptile genetics are immensely strong, they decided that they would become the new leading race of the, um, the 10 universal cycles of the LPU, the uh, universal matrix, and began to fight against the D11 collective because the D10 collective, they had just as much right to be in the leading faction since they were close to the, the Lyran system, the Draco system is close to that. And they technically became the originators of the later groups that turned into what we call the... Um, they repositioned themselves as royals, that's what I'm saying. And they became the overseers and some of the cedars of some of the, the when we talk about the reseeding after the fall of Atlantis. They teamed up with some of the Niburians and became some of the progenitor, quote unquote, races for some of the Niburians and the Baal lineages that we now know of inside our reality field as part of uh, the Cabal and the, the controlling factions that are in uh, have been for a very long time part of uh, controlling and administering our reality field under the Draco reptilians. Okay, so so that was uh, part of that one, and I am I think at this point you have enough understanding that when you go back and read or choose to read the Souls of Humanity, that will give you enough background information to look into the the different stages of. Um, how things change from a specific level of reality field into another type of reality field. The timeline event itself I have explained in more details in the perception logs. The perception logs one to six, as I have them on my website, they are what we call an updated version of the souls of humanity and the timeline event and what took place before that and after that, as I recall it from my own memories. And where I want to go here in the next podcast is that I want to talk about the ancient stellar races. After the timeline event and the division of the series system, uh, at the time where we can say everything changed due to the timeline event, and what were the groups that spawned, were spawned from that and grew out of that, 
which will lead us to the understanding of some of the issues that we have now as we are in the completion cycles where all the timelines converge into one big timeline where we will either have to meet up and unify or one more time split off and then initiate the final divide um, between the, the original races and the humanoid races and solidify that one into two completely different parallel universal structures and by that creating two types of universal cycles, which is completely unheard of in all of history. But before I move on with the text material, I want to address some thoughts. And this is just me speaking freely outside the text material, outside my book, The Source of Humanity. First and foremost, the I want to uh, touch ground with the, the Asgardians, and I want to talk uh, a little bit about the Maldakians, and I want to talk a little about the Blue Syrian races, as well as our perception of Mars, Moon, and Maldak. And I know it was a little bit clunky uh, earlier in this podcast, but the, the point is, and, and I think that's important to address as well, there are many different people that have different uh, interpretation of our solar system and its history. And we could say, as I talked about before, it's either due to different angles uh, of perception, because we interpret things differently, all depending on where we are. And then there's something that's common ground, and then there's something that's intercepted, the timelines, uh, or the code streams that holding this information that people can tap into that have the ability to do so has been intercepted and false information has been put into these code streams as well due to the intersecting artificial timelines. So sometimes we are on the right code stream and we interpret history in a specific way and then we're thrown off into an artificial timeline that takes us into a specific program targeted and tailored for the purpose of throwing us off of our own true history. So I'm not claiming that my history is the right one, not at all. I'm claiming this is my history. This is what I get. This is what I see. This is what I interpret it to be. And it could be utterly, completely not as it actually was, but as I explained in other places, when we perceive reality, be it just in this life, just look back at some of your old childhood memories, how accurate you are in interpreting your, um, just from this life, childhood memories. If you have a sibling, Talk with that sibling and hear how he or she has interpreted the same situation. And you will discover just there that you have two different interpretations of it, that you saw it in two different ways. That does not mean that the sibling's interpretation is more correct than yours or vice versa. It just means that we literally perceive reality differently. It is relative reality due to the state we're in, due to our mental faculties due to our emotional faculties and how we perceive and interpret information. So we can only say there's only one quote unquote truth and that's the truth we have. Not that that leads us into what we call, what is it called, solipsism, where it's, just, it's all about me and myself and my interpretation, everybody else is wrong. That's segregation. But it's like saying, well, I have interpreted this way. These are the information. This is the information I picked up. What does others say about the same information? What have they picked up? How can we combine these pieces of the puzzle so that we can begin to piece it together and say, okay, if you got that and I got that and you've seen it like that one and I've seen it like that one, well, what are we dealing with here? Are we dealing with interception? Are we dealing with manipulation? Are we dealing with actual history? Are we dealing with different uh, perception of history? And what's going on here? And then go in and say, what is important of history? Can we even get an accurate interpretation of history? And I would say, actually, we can't. So the purpose is, again, what is history to be made for and what is history to be used as? Is it to be used as this is how it was and so no more discussion? Of course not. This is about looking in and saying, what is the purpose of us rediscovering our planetary history and our solar system history? That is to have a frame of reference so that when we have our own memories of whatever it is, we can combine that play ball with the joint uh, piece together type of information or history that we have or different 
people that have put forth different levels of information and then say, well, I don't resonate with that. Yeah, that uh, that kind of sounds slightly, or I have a vague memory of that. And then instead of saying, this is the truth, then work with it. How does that apply to your own activation process? How does that apply to your work with your consciousness units? Does it add in and amplify, fill up some gaps? Does it give you more context so you can go in deeper and look into it? And again, be aware that sometimes this information, these information streams are targeted and intercepted and put into artificial programs. So it's a very, very complex work that we're doing here. And that also goes into the, the ability to quote unquote remote view. And I put it in quotation here because are we really remote viewing or are we reading the code streams? Are we being fed information? Is it actually something we're seeing or are we being intercepted when we know there is the possibility of uh, tampering with the neural network? Then, then when someone expands his or her mind field out and begins to read information, is it accurate or is it then intercepted and put in? So we don't really know. There could be bits and pieces of it that is accurate, and there could be a lot of deception. So this is the this is the difficulty in the discernment. When I want to talk a little bit about the Asgardians, I I have uh, coined them that as any other, and many others have as well. And the typical representation of the Asgardians you will find on the internet is the one that was first. I remember that type of gray was used in the Stargate SG One TV show. And here they were called the Asgardians. And we can always discuss whether or not that's accurate information or that has been put in there to throw us off from how they really look. But if you say Asgardians, then that is the picture that that's the image that my brain picks up on. And others have utilized it as well. Do they look like that? I have to break through the holographic overlay because we must also remember that quite a lot of these TV shows as well as Let's say we have three big, there are lots of them. I haven't watched them all, but I can mention three that I know I have looked into. Star Wars, Star Trek, and Stargate. Interestingly enough, Star Wars, Star Trek, and Stargate. And we have different representation of other wealthy species in these three types of um, uh, movies and TV shows, right? So it is, if you ask me which one of these would I say were most in alignment with what I would interpret to be uh, in, in uh, coherence with my memories. And I would say Star Wars, not at all, cannot recognize any of it. Uh, and the story, uh, not really. The only thing there would be the councils, but we have that in Star Trek as well in some of the newer uh, representation of that too. And there I would say Star Trek, if we go in and look at that one, if I am to interpret that one, then I'd say, well, that's the dream of the secret space program that has been tailored into the future, where it's now completely legit that humans travel around. And as I've said other places, I prefer the older ones, actually the first ones that came out where it was clear that we were like elephants in a china shop and demolishing everything <laughs> because we really didn't know the rules of engagement. And then later on it appeared as it, yeah, now we now know, and then it just became this kind of success accessory type of thing instead of actually going into a story that might have some kind of importance for uh, the lot of us as a kind of disclosure, limited disclosure as it's been called. So, um, so when I say, where can I say, well, this one, this one brings mostly uh, in coherence with my memories. And then you can say, well, because you watch that, then it has influenced your memories. And then we don't really know what's true and what's not true. And that's so completely true. That's part of these TV shows. But there are things there that was not shown other places, such as the TGs, the little wormy things. Uh, that was inserted, as well as the reviving chambers, as well as the age regressing chambers, as well as the different forms of otherworldly civilizations that were human looking and onward and so forth. And the idea of traveling with Stargates and founding it in Egypt. And there is also the one, the Stargate movie on Antarctica and using time travel. So I would say we, if we look at these, there are different factions behind each and one of these um, TV shows slash movies that are presenting information for us. And again, it, it, it's all about what resonates mostly uh, with who and what we are and, and what we remember and what we recall. 
So when we talk about the Asgardians, if I push through the holographic overlay, it was now been tailored for our memory as well as when we look into this, they look dissimilar, but they are semi-organic now. They are not fully organic anymore. They don't have this Valhalla look anymore. And I know there are some of the Maldakians that, uh, if you remember from early in this podcast, they used to be from Maldak, which had its own name. You could actually, you can dub it Asgard, if you like. Maldak, Asgard, we can dub it the same. And they were peaceful. They were working with uh, different forms of plant kingdoms, similarly as some of the Pleiadian races was as well. And in that one, we, and that's long before the timeline event, keep reminding you, remember, before the timeline, after the timeline event, and there were not planets and galaxies and solar systems before the timeline event. That occurred after the timeline event. And that, that models up or makes history more difficult for us to look into. However, when we talk about <clears throat> these things, the uh, Asgardians are playing again. They're here again. They have come back again from a future where they have been, as far as I can see and as far as I can get of information, have been in contact with the Niburians and by that have been granted a new type of vessel. Uh, the Niburians that I look at, they are very similar to, to the Pleiadian uh, reptilian races, that's the Rostilians, as I call it, in the souls of humanity. That's Pleiadians that were taken over in the Orion Wars, uh, were taken to the Orion system, some of them to the Draco system, got reptilian genetics inserted, and still have their, their pretty blue-eyed, blonde-haired appearance, but were changed into what we understand as the Nordics. So the Asgardians and the Nordics are two different groups. And that's also important to understand. So if we say the Asgardians are the Maldakians that were similar in appearance because they, they were a cousin to the Pleiadians, but they changed into different types of organic vessels later on due to the timeline event, then things begin to add up a little bit uh, further into the understanding of okay, what we are actually dealing with here. And since the Asgardians are now back with some of the Niburians from the future, because we have a lot of, of future travelers coming back now um, after the different hiccups of the resetting of the new grand cycle, they come back in new forms and new versions from wherever they travel to living outside of time and space and then coming back for us a short time period for them perhaps uh, in our time uh, millions of years and by that have changed themselves from what they were when they took off to what they are when they come back. And in that we now have some of the Asgardians and the Maldakians that are coming back in these semi-organic vessels that they have been granted from the Niborians. And in that also understanding, well, then they're in cahoots with the future Niburians. And then we should ask ourselves, the future Niburians, who and what are they? And that's, a, that's, that's part of the groups that took off uh, that were uh, as part of the fourth uh, cycle seeding, reseeding after the fall of Atlantis. And they are the descendants of the Anunnaki. And again, and forward and back, and that makes it very, very difficult um, when we talk about who are the aliens, right? <laughs> Which version? Before the timeline event, after the timeline event, from the current time period or from the future? Which one are we talking about here? Which version of them are we talking about here, right? So that's another level of when we talk about the, the extraterrestrial, the superterrestrials, the metaterrestrials, the non-human, the non-terrestrials, or whatever we would like to call them, different language, right? Um, the other civilizations that were part of our solar system that I classify as humanoids. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the blue-skinned Syrians because there are also there's also confusion here as well. And when I was pulled into uh, in 2017, I was pulled into some of the secret bases on Earth. Uh, whether it was an interception, whether it was a program, or whether it was real or not, always up for discussion. But I was pulled in. I when that happens, I get so tired, I have to lie down, and then my energy system is pulled out of my body, I am observing, but my energy system of, uh, my high order energy system is then put into either is reformed as an orb or it's put into a clone, and then I can walk with them in the fourth dimension, because this is in the fourth dimension. 
And then I'm there observing everything, have communications as if I'm actually there. So, and hence also when we talk about uh, when they were done with me, threw me to the scavengers and these were the clones they had arranged for me because they actually asked for me if I want to be part of this program and I declined. And due to that, they were they were playing a little bit around with me, seeing if I, if, if, if I could catch the interest and gave me information, but I still, I wasn't keen on it because I saw these uh, different uh, human reptoid uh, hybrids uh, you recall I had one of them on uh, and when I had my healing practice uh, I got one of them as a fourth dimensional holographic imprint it was literally lying on my healing table and it was there so physical I could touch it I could work with it it was not visible for anybody else but they, they can plant in things from the fourth dimension and and literally create a sphere in the room that we're in where the fourth dimension is present and by that you have that that area um, which was on my my healing table that was then changed into a bubble of fourth dimensional energies where they had the the real deal lying on uh, on, on a table in in the fourth dimension in these science labs and this was a, a soldier that had died but he looked reptilian but it was inserted technology and they were testing me to see if I knew how to find the technology the implant in the brain that created a holographic overlay making him look like a reptilian or if I was capable of dis dissembling it and turn him back into the human that he used to be. But I could see he had been enhanced with a lot of reptilian genetics and that was literally spliced into his human DNA. So the device in the brain was not just only shape-shifting him, but it was also upholding the reptilian code systems in his human DNA that allowed him to shape-shift. So that was a very advanced type of technology that some of these hidden programs are using when they are targeting humans, playing reptilians when they in fact actually are humans that have been re-engineered. But they have got these genetics from someone, right? They have got it from somewhere. So, so that was a little bit of the shenanigans that were going on. Eventually, I just declined altogether to try to push some of their human hybrid projects my way to see if I could uh, remote heal uh, some of the gene codes uh, with some of the issues with the insectoid genetics. So so from this, I've, I've got a lot of information and it was just all done in the fourth dimension. As I was, I got something with the in the fourth dimensional field presented with that task inside this reality, not in dream time, real living. It could take me hours to look at it, figure out what it was as if I I actually had that um, being or that human on my healing table as if they had booked a time and said, here, here, is our, here is our enhanced human and we want you to heal him and fix him and whatever, what have you, or figure out what's wrong here, what's the gene code sequence that needs to be repaired and these kind of things. And I think they were doing it to test to see what I actually had of knowledge from original um, abilities of working with gene code sequences holographically. So so this, this is part of that one. So that's the interpretation. And since I didn't live up to what they asked of me, they dumped me in my clones and that's, that's got me into quite a lot of trouble, let me put it that way. I've got a lot of experiences that's been done with these clones, including I had the same experience in Australia where I was when we were traveling to the blue moon, uh, blue moon, yeah, the the blue mountain. My friend and I and I got pulled out the same way and and thrown into an interrogation room where I had one of these uh, enhanced humans interrogating me while I was sitting in the car. So a lot of things is possible when we begin to understand the dynamics of the fourth dimension and how much control these groups have of the enclosure. <laughs> There's not one thing going on in here that is not under control, just so you completely wrap your head around that. So when we talk about some of the blue-skinned uh, Syrians, the later group that I saw, and these are some of what's called the root races, I was presented with in some of these facilities after being shifted into a clone and we were walking there. They were showing me these kind of different laboratories. I saw greys, I saw reptilians, I saw the mantids, I saw the tall greys. I have uh, encountered some of the tall whites when they were still here and in, in some of these things, but I was never there physically. I was not picked up by a craft or a black SUV big, uh, drove up in front of my door and put me somewhere and drove me somewhere. I was not picked up during nighttime as an out of body experience. It was all done during daytime when I was awake. I just got crazily tired. I got bust up into the fourth dimension pulled out a replicate of my holographic energy system 
inserted that into a clone and by that participated in whatever was going on in the fourth dimension. That's how far they've got now. They don't need to do the physical pulls in anymore. Point being, so so while I was there observing and, and got and shown the different things, later on it became a little bit more unpleasant. The mantids didn't want to do it the nice way, so they did it during dream time. Uh, so I have, and that's why I was put in the chair, so I have many different uh, levels of information and memories that are dissimilar to people that are living in the States, for instance, what they have of things because I live in Denmark. So, so my point of saying this is that there's much more going on. You don't have to live these places to be pulled into these projects. You can actually be pulled in no matter where you are. In, when I was in Australia, I had recollections of being in Bolivia in a training camp. So, so this, this is also some of the things that, anyways, that's, that's a whole other story. Point being, I was pulled in and there I saw the Aryan Shivas as I talk about in the Souls of Humanity as well. And these are the blue skinned Syrians that are the ancestors of the Aryans that later, that, that inhabited the Indus Valley, but they are of, of lunar origin. So they technically don't belong to this system, but they have Syrian genetics in them as well. And for me, the blue skin is the giving off of the Syrian system. And that's where when I talk about the original Sirius work, workstation that had different groupings to it, as I talk about in the Souls of Humanity and depicts there. And there were a density three consciousness, density three level rays, which we now classify as sixth dimension, which is technically density two. So again, this is the understanding how things have, have kind of regressed into lesser and lesser states. And these Aryan Shivas, they looked exactly like the Hindu gods. Seriously, white skinned and blue skinned. The white skins had more lunar genetics. Typical trait of the lunars, white skin. Blue skin, typical trait of the Syrians, especially the Syrian bees later on. Red skinned, typically trait of the Syrian A's. And we're here talking about after the timeline event. So that's my experience of that one. So, so that I have seen, which then literally confirmed for me, well, there are no gods, right? There are different groups of what we call non-human origin in terms of both non-human compared to us inside the enclosure, as well as non-human compared to the original true humans that I refer to. That's why I call them true humans. Not that the others are false humans, but they're humanoids and you now have the history so you to back you up in that, um, that understanding. I think that's that's what I wanted to add in here before I move uh, further into the text material. So at at the end of the day, uh, and I know I'm getting a little bit of panicky feeling here because I am a little bit concerned that I might give too much information and I might get uh, some kind of uh, reprimand, as it's called in French, uh, might get a little bit of counter on that one or someone coming telling me I'm not supposed to share this information. Um, but it's um, there are pieces I can share and there are pieces I can't share yet. I will share it when the time is right. I can say for a certainty some of the programs I was part of back then or were invited to be part of, which I declined, um, they are no longer there. Most of these groups they took off on August 31st, I thought, I think it was in 2018, where they went to some of the other um, uh, realms with some of the ones they have collaborated with. And we're here talking about some of the hidden programs that had humans, enhanced humans in them. And they got a bit of a scare there and returned and began a whole new group that uh, kind of became the white hats within these original projects. Because you kind of see in the original projects, they thought they were actually working with, quote unquote, their best buddies. And then discover that when they actually went to the system that they had been promised, they would get a new a new civilization. They, they enhance them with these genetics, get to these systems, become part of a new human civilization where they could continue their existence because they were told that this planet would would not continue as it is, which we know in 2135, then, then that's it. And then we're in a completely different setting of our reality, whatever that means. Depends on our choices, right? But that's the demarcation line there. Uh, whatever comes from there is where we could say that's the, the end date of the enclosure as we know of it. And then something else will come, whatever that is, that's up for us to decide that future. 
But they came back, and then because they they understood once they came to that system where they had been promised these new cities and these new futures and yada yada, all too good to be true, which it was. They came there and discovered that they were just to be another slave race. And they, some of the ones that had had these inserted different types of genetics, once they came there, completely stripped of it and then lost all of their prerogatives. And whoever had not landed yet, they got that information and they just turned right back and came back on a different timeline and began to work against these programs. So that's why we suddenly had a division within these programs, because some of them discovered that they had been fed with misinformation. Let's just put it that way. They had been fed with a lot of, of manipulated information that had pieces of truth to it, but not all of it. So they have come back from the future. These are some of the future humanities that, and they then began to travel into the future where they, and followed the timelines of when they came back, played that one out, and then came back from that future and began the long process of going back and correcting what they have done of mistakes, because they understood that what they had invited their groups of humans into, and, and this enhancement led to some very, very unfortunate futures. And in that context, you are to see the enhanced soldier on my table, because they were trying to ask me to, could this be undone? Could they have done this differently? And that's another version of it as well. And at the same time, I also had memory, uh, experiences where, again, I was pulled in in some kind of a very hostile environment where I was being drugged all the time and I saw reptilians, it was weird, and they asked me to do weird stuff. So, And that was one of the horror shows experiences I have also had. And that's when you're in a chair, you get, you get completely drugged with something and then you see something, you have absolutely no idea what it is. So, so that's another one. And a portion of me was actually kept, well, we say conscious because one of the mantis kept my my um, my concentration or my ability to observe the, what was going on from the outside and telling me he was looking at he hold me if the other ones didn't want, want him to but he held my consciousness in that bubble where he said this is being done to you focus see what's going on understand this room understand this project this is not your good friends and that's technically one of the reasons why i also declined into these projects because it appeared that that i saw was being brought around the bases in that clone but at the same time i saw another clone on the table that being done horrible stuff to different experimentation so there was this there was this the nice version of the program and then there was the opposite of it so again Again, and, and we could say, well, did the man intercept because they didn't want you in the program? So these are the questions we are left with. <laughs> Nobody can say for for uh, with great clarity that that's the right choice. Not at all. As I said, some of the enhanced humans, they went there and they got very, very unpleasantly surprised at what the, the plan actually had been. So when we talk about some of the future humanities that have come back, they are now trying to repair the damage that they have done. And that's going back in many multiple timelines. And that's another story for another day. But of course, I'm not going to share all of that with you because I can share what they did last year. That's okay, because they already corrected it now. And they now know that all the timelines will converge. And they are collaborating with the new inner domain from the Andromedan system, which they have been, uh, they are now living in the outskirts of the Andromedan system. And with that, they are protected. But they are also kind of, yeah, please don't talk. They are not sharing a lot of that information because the moment it's shared, well, everybody knows it, right? The moment they share it to human inside this reality, we get scanned. They get the information. So you can't really uh, tell anyone what's going on. Hence also the, the different levels of information that people are given. Hence also disinformation sometimes within what we call the white hat projects. So it makes it very, very difficult. And one of the things I think that those of us who are in the mix of this, this very difficult type of work is to understand how, what kind of game that's being played there. It's like being part of a movie with, with what we could call spy game or a cold war game or something on the highest level up of different types of, of deep undercover type of deception <laughs> that nobody knows what's going on, even within the different programs. Nobody knows what's going on because of the scanning technology. 
because of the ability to pull in the holographic energy system, because of the ability to clone, because of the ability to, to reinstitute, so to speak, a different energy system in an already existing human, the ability to do holographic overlay, the ability to do holographic inserts, the ability to mind wipe, the ability to transform by going back and forth in time, the ability to age regress, the ability to, to replenish or reposition a human in, in the moment that we don't know of. They can literally, if they like, go in in any reality setting, pull out a human from the context and put back in another version of the same human one second later and nobody in the room will see the difference other than why does that person suddenly sound different? Why does that person suddenly shift topic and talk about something entirely else? What was that brain meld that apparently happened there? Because we, we can't see that and it's not in our mindset yet that this is possible with technology, but it is. So we are in a game that's much, 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 much more advanced and complex now than we have ever in our wildest fantasies been able to dream of. And that's where I want to end this one before I go back and talk about the ancient stellar races and go back to the Souls of Humanity book and continue from that one. Because there is important pieces of information that needs to be shared there as well. But now we've got a little bit of heads up that when I continue to talk about the different groups, either from the past or from the future, before the timeline, after the timeline event, are they real? Is it holographic overlay? Can we trust the information? And this is what I want you to pay attention to is that literally, as has been said in so many movies, don't trust anyone, not even yourself. Thank you.